everyone, and welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Rounds presentation on Beyond Flu, Trends in Respiratory Infection Outbreaks in Ontario Healthcare Settings from 2007 to 2017 and Implications for Non-Influenza Outbreak Management. My name is Michelle Murdy, and I'm the Medical Director at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Before we begin with today's presentation, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. Firstly, the chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use the Q&A pod if you have questions during the session. You can enter your questions throughout the session and we will be answering them at the end of the session. A discussion and question period will follow the presentation. If at any point during the session, you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. I'd like to state that as moderator of the session, I do not have any potential conflicts of interest to declare. It's now my pleasure to introduce the speakers for today's session, Camille Chonu and Catherine Bifitis. Camille is an epidemiologist lead within the research evaluation and continuous quality improvement team at Public Health Ontario. She specializes in research and surveillance activities focused on healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial resistant organisms. Catherine is a regional IPAC specialist at Public Health Ontario. She's a certified public health inspector, holds an MSc in epidemiology, and is currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Population Medicine at Ontario Veterinary College, with a research focus on outbreak detection and public health surveillance. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Camille, who will start the session. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, first slide, please, Camille. Before we start our presentation, I'd like to take a second to acknowledge our co-authors listed here for their valuable insights and contributions, as the research we are presenting to you today was recently published in the Canada Communicable Disease Report. For those who are interested in reading the full publication, we have provided the citation and publication link at the end of the presentation slides. Next slide, please. Neither Camille nor I have any conflicts of interest to declare and we have not received any financial or other support from a sponsor for this presentation. Next slide, please. The objectives of today's presentation are to provide you with a brief overview of viral respiratory pathogens that are commonly associated with outbreaks in Ontario healthcare settings, to more specifically describe any identified trends in respiratory outbreaks in Ontario long-term care homes, retirement homes, and in hospitals from 2007 to 2017, to outline and discuss considerations for pathogen-specific outbreak management based on these observed trends, and finally, to review the impact of COVID-19 infection control practices on non-COVID-19 outbreaks in these settings in 2020. To get you thinking about the research we will present to you today, first we have two poll questions for you. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer these. Hopefully by the end of this presentation, we will have answered each of these questions for you in more detail. Next slide, please. So first, some background on why we thought it was important to do this research. Outbreaks of viral respiratory pathogens, such as influenza and rhinovirus, occur often in healthcare settings, such as hospitals, long-term care homes, and retirement homes, and particularly during fall and winter months, when people are spending more time indoors. These outbreaks place a large burden on the healthcare system, and when a confirmed outbreak is declared in a healthcare setting, this has implications for resident or patient movement within the facility, for admissions and transfers, and can also have an impact on visitors and staffing. In addition to the logistical challenges posed by outbreak management, there are also health implications for affected residents or patients, as they may be at an increased risk for severe outcomes due to underlying comorbidities or increased age. Preventing and rapidly controlling potential outbreaks is therefore important to minimize any potential impacts to these vulnerable populations. The most common viral respiratory pathogens identified in Ontario healthcare settings are influenza, and more commonly influenza A, rhinovirus, enterovirus, and more recently, severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, abbreviated as SARS-CoV-2, the pathogen responsible for causing coronavirus disease or COVID-19. Some pathogens are more easily transmissible than others, and similarly, some pathogens have a greater potential to cause severe illness and death. For example, influenza can lead to pneumonia or a worsening of underlying medical conditions such as chronic lung disease or heart disease. And as we saw during 2020, 
COVID-19 tragically resulted in a high case fatality rate among residents in long-term care homes in particular. Next slide, please. Before we get into our study findings, we will start with a brief overview and comparison of common viral respiratory pathogens in Ontario. Next slide, please. There are many different viral respiratory pathogens that routinely circulate in Ontario communities each year, particularly during the fall and winter months. And if these are suspected or confirmed to be causing illness in a healthcare setting, such as a hospital, long-term care home or retirement home, an outbreak may be declared. Some, like rhinovirus, a virus that circulates primarily in the spring, summer and early fall, cause relatively mild self-limiting respiratory symptoms. Others, like influenza, cause mild to severe respiratory illness and in some cases death, particularly among older adults or the very young. Prior to the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, influenza was the only virus on this list where a vaccine was available to prevent transmission. While these pathogens differ in terms of how commonly they are identified during outbreaks each year, there are a lot of similarities between many of these, particularly in terms of symptom presentation and seasonality, making it difficult to know which pathogen may be causing illness unless confirmatory testing is performed, which we'll, Camille will discuss later in this presentation. Next slide, please. Pathogen identification is important as it can also have implications for outbreak management. In Ontario, for example, most viral respiratory outbreaks can generally be declared over eight days after symptom onset in the last identified patient or resident case. This equates to one incubation period plus one communicable period for influenza or three plus five days. In the case of some pathogens with a longer incubation and or communicable period, such as SARS-CoV-2 or HMPV, the amount of time between identification of the last case and lifting of outbreak restrictions may need to be extended to ensure that there are no further cases incubating within the facility. Some pathogens are also more easily transmissible than others. The basic reproductive number, or R0, represents the average number of people that will be infected by an ill individual assuming a completely susceptible population. For influenza, this number is around 1.3, while for SARS-CoV-2, estimates of R0 vary, but are estimated to be around 3.3 and may be higher for newer variants or strains of the virus. For example, the R0 for the Delta strain of the virus may be as high as 9, which is almost as infectious as chickenpox, which has an R0 of 10 to 12. As R0 increases, so too does the herd immunity threshold or percentage of the population that needs to be immune and no longer able to either become infected or to pass infection on to others in order to reduce the ability of the disease to continue to spread. Rapid case identification and implementation of control measures aimed at preventing further transmission of illness should be a priority in order to quickly control a potential outbreak. Next slide, please. While the symptoms shown here do not include all of the possible symptoms associated with various viral respiratory pathogens, there are some similarities in the clinical presentation of many respiratory viruses, making it difficult to differentiate between these based on symptom presentation alone. For example, Someone who is ill with any of influenza, rhinovirus, RSV, or SARS-CoV-2 may have a runny nose and or a cough, making it difficult to differentiate between potential causes of illness for an individual who presents with either or both of these symptoms. Conversely, some symptoms are considered to be more unique to a particular pathogen. For example, a loss of taste or smell is known to occur in some COVID-19 cases, but this is not a typical symptom of other respiratory infections. While the presence of this symptom may increase suspicion that the affected individual may be ill with COVID-19 and should be a prompt for confirmatory testing, the absence of this symptom cannot rule out infection. Next slide, please. I will now hand it over to Camille to talk about viral respiratory outbreak detection and management. Good afternoon, everyone. So in Ontario, the primary reference guide for respiratory outbreaks is the Control of Respiratory Infection Outbreaks in Long-Term Care Homes 2018. This document applies to both long-term care homes and retirement homes, even though a retirement home is not expressly listed as an institution in the Health Protection and Promotion Act. Boards of health, however, often do consider retirement homes to fall under the definition of an institution where it specifies any other place of a similar nature. And this is considered a reasonable interpretation of this definition. Most of the outbreak management guidance is generalized. There are some specific recommendations for influenza outbreaks, as this is one of the few viral pathogens where interventions such as vaccination and antiviral prophylaxis are available. However, for the remaining viral pathogens, the same recommendations are applied broadly. Within the outbreak management guidance, the roles of 
public health units are clearly outlined and include ensuring surveillance processes are in place to identify and report outbreaks, confirming the existence of outbreaks, declaring outbreaks over, providing education and guidance on outbreak prevention and management, as well as IPAC policies. PHO provides scientific and technical advice to healthcare stakeholders, including long-term care and retirement homes and hospitals as well as conducting surveillance for diseases of public health significance. Public Health Ontario Laboratory, PHOL, um, conducts testing for various infectious diseases, including diseases of public health significance and performs laboratory surveillance. Many long-term care homes and retirement homes typically submit respiratory outbreak specimens to the Public Health Ontario Lab. While hospitals may submit outbreak specimens to PHOL, some have their own laboratories which can do the testing as well. So all of respiratory outbreaks in, in institutions and hospitals in Ontario are reportable to the local public health units. The following case definitions are outlined in Appendix B of the Infectious Diseases Protocol. If two or more cases of acute respiratory illness with an epidemiological link are identified in an institution or hospital within a 48 hour period, then a suspect outbreak may be declared. ARI is defined as onset of acute respiratory symptoms, including a runny nose or sneezing, um, sore throat, fever, muscle aches, or a dry cough. Epi links include a shared common ex uh, exposure, such as being in a common area of the facility, for example, a unit or, uh, or floor. A single case of infection, um, one lab confirmed case of influenza, may be considered, considered a suspect outbreak. Uh, confirmed outbreak is defined as two cases of acute respiratory infections um, within 48 hours with any common epi link, at least uh, one of which must be lab confirmed, or three cases of ARI, um, lab, lab, laboratory confirmation not necessary, occurring within 48 hours with any common epi link. Typically, um, when a respiratory outbreak is suspected in a healthcare setting, a nasal pharyngeal uh, swab is collected from ill residents or patients and submitted for testing. Normally, specimens are collected from these individuals, um, from those individuals with the most recent onset of illness. PHOL usually accepts only four specimens per outbreak um, for respiratory virus testing, and but the PHU could request more if they had a good reason, for example, change in symptoms or suspecting uh, resistance resistance, for example. The rationale for the limit is that the pathogen can typically be detected in approximately 92% of outbreaks within the first four specimens. So if these are submitted to the Public Health Ontario Lab, they're typically tested using a testing panel, which includes influenza A and B, as well as a number of respiratory viruses. The testing panel used by the lab has evolved over time, and I'll provide further details on the next few slides. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, an outbreak may be declared by health unit based on the presence of three um, ARI cases in a, in a unit of a facility. However, a laboratory confirmation of illness is not required for an outbreak to be declared and for control measures to be initiated. Um, confirmatory testing is encouraged wherever possible as causative pathogens cannot, um, cannot be identified based on symptom presentation and seasonality alone. And in the case of influenza, um, rapid administration of antivirals can help shorten the duration and impact of the outbreak. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, testing is done on all patients and residents um, linked uh, to the outbreak, um, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic contacts. Um, and uh, an additional um, testing, respiratory, sorry, respiratory virus testing is done on the first four symptomatic patients. Since part of our presentation will be focused on historical data going back to 2007, we've provided a timeline of some key respiratory viral uh, testing changes at the Public Health Ontario Lab that have occurred since 2007-08. Uh, um, in the earlier years, we relied on viral culture and rapid influenza detection tests. Um, rapid turnaround time for confirming influenza is necessary for outbreak and case management, given the availability of antivirals to reduce transmission and morbidity. In the spring of 2009, um, a novel uh, influenza A H1N1 virus emerged in Mexico and was detected first in the United States. It spread quickly across the US and the world. And in spring 2009, um, 
PHO introduced RT-PCR testing for influenza A and B. And then subsequently in 2010, multiplex respiratory virus PCR, also known as MRVP, was uh, introduced and which could test for multiple pathogens at a time. Influenza A, B, rhinovirus, RSV, parainfluenza, adenovirus, HMPV, and seasonal coronavirus. The introduction of a more routine MRVP testing, which is more rapid and more sensitive, allows us to examine epitrends in respiratory outbreaks due to different pathogens. Um, similar changes have been impl implemented in other laboratories, for example, in hospitals. In a survey of testing practices carried out by IQMH, 23% um, of laboratories performed multiplex molecular testing. There were some changes to MRVP testing volumes in uh, 2018, 2019, and more recently in the 2020, 21 uh, season um, with the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic, a new uh, fluvid testing panel was introduced that tests for influenza A, influenza B, SARS-CoV-2 and RSV. Um, these were selected primarily due to the availability of interventions. So largely, uh, Fluvid replaced MRVP for outbreaks and institu institutionalized non-outbreak patients. This was done to focus efforts primarily on detecting influenza and COVID as other respiratory viruses were not being identified in outbreaks and institutions. MRVP was still available uh, upon request. Um, and then more recently, um, starting in July of 20, uh, July 26, there's been an expansion now of MRVP as it was felt to be clinically necessary for optimal outbreak management when other non-COVID viruses are circulating. Another advantage is more surveillance data, especially with the addition of MRVP testing for children in um, the ER. So this just summarizes um, some of the testing over um, that more recently. So in uh, prior to just prior to um, 2020, a max of four specimens collected from ill residents and patients would be submitted to the Public Health Ontario Lab, and these specimens underwent rapid influenza testing to identify influenza A, B, followed by the multiplex respiratory virus uh, PCR. Um, and of course, uh, changes to the testing algorithms at uh, PHOL have occurred um, over the past year and a half with the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic. And here we have everyone linked to a respiratory outbreak tested for SARS-CoV-2 regardless of symptoms. I mentioned earlier the introduction of the fluvid assay in the fall of uh, 2020. Um, and the, the use of MRVP has evolved during this time from being routinely performed to only being performed upon request for patients that meet PHL um, laboratory test acceptance criteria. Um, and uh, now in July of 26, 21, it being uh, expanded once again. And this table provides a summary of the patient setting and the testing currently available upon request. So now that you have an overview of respiratory outbreak reporting in Ontario, we'll I'll delve into the findings from our recent publication in CCDR on the respiratory outbreak trends in Ontario health settings. So our analysis focused on the surveillance period from 2007 to 2017. And although it predates the collection of data on COVID-19 outbreaks in Ontario healthcare settings, our study does provide a useful baseline and comparator for future studies that will likely aim to assess the broader impact of COVID-19 prevention and control measures in these settings. As mentioned earlier, there were substantial changes in testing that have occurred during the surveillance period, which will help improve our understanding and knowledge of the impact of respiratory viruses in terms of outbreaks in healthcare settings. And with this enhanced ability to differentiate between causative pathogens, there is an opportunity to <clears throat> sorry, to tailor infection prevention and control measures to a specific pathogen, likely reducing the need for unnecessary or overly restrictive control measures in uh, certain situations. So our primary objectives were to examine pathogen-specific trends in respiratory outbreaks and to determine whether median attack rates, outbreak duration, and overall case fatality rates differed for pathogen-specific outbreaks in different healthcare settings. So for our data analysis, we pulled all confirmed reported respiratory outbreaks uh, between September 1st, 2007 to August 31st, 2017 from IFIS and selected those occurring in healthcare settings. 
each respiratory outbreak season was defined from September 1st to August of the following year. And we counted outbreaks based on the reported date. If that was missing, we used the created date. We grouped all enterovirus and minovirus outbreaks together since depending on the test used, um, they may not have been differentiated. We also grouped all influenza into a single category. If there was more than one pathogen identified, we classified the outbreak as multiple, um, or if none were identified, unknown. We calculated case fatality rates, um, outbreak duration, and, at and attack rates for only those outbreaks where there was valid data, and we excluded the remainder. So the results, um, over this 10-year uh, period, there were 9,870 respiratory outbreaks in healthcare settings. The vast majority, 92%, were in long-term care retirement homes. That's the blue, um, that's shaded blue here in this donut chart, um, with only 8% in hospitals. This is not really surprising as we have over 1,300 long-term care homes and retirement homes and 150 hospital corporations in Ontario. We collapsed the long-term care homes and the retirement homes together because for many, long-term care and retirement floors and wings are in, the same, are in the same facility. And for quite a number of outbreaks, it was difficult to differentiate based on the outbreak information provided. This graph shows the number of respiratory outbreaks by season over the 10-year surveillance period, blue indicating the long-term care retirement home settings and the green indicating hospitals. In both hospital and long-term care retirement home settings over the after 2009-2010 uh, uh, respiratory season, the number of outbreaks appear to increase following a biennial cycle. And in the next slide, you'll see that this trend is driven primarily by influenza. So here's a similar graph um, showing the distribution of respiratory outbreaks by pathogen over the same 10 year period. A couple of key observations to note, this dark red line indicates the um, outbreaks where the patch pathogen was not identified and you'll see the proportion decreased in 2009 and has remained um, low, largely due, we believe, to the implementation of multiplex PCR, the MRVP, which tests for multiple pathogens. As a result, you see an increase in um, other respiratory pathogens. You also observe influenza um, with the uh, biannual uh, cyclical path pattern um, with increases occurring um, every second year compared to the previous year. This uh, biannual trend appears to correspond to influenza A, H3N2 dominant seasons, and is consistent with previous research, which has shown that there are typically increased numbers of influenza outbreaks in hospital settings in influenza A, H3N2 dominant years. Now this bar chart summarizes a breakdown by pathogen over the 10 year surveillance period. In influenza was the most common cause of outbreaks in both long-term care, retirement homes and hospital settings accounting for 32% and 51% respectively, followed by enterorhinovirus. You'll note there appears to be a large difference in the pr proportion of respiratory outbreaks due to unknown pathogens between hospitals and long-term care retirement home settings. This may be attributed to differing testing algorithms between hospitals and long-term care retirement home facilities as long-term care or retirement homes typically rely on the Pu Public Health Ontario Lab for testing, while many hospitals have internal cap capacity for testing with different testing criteria. This graph shows the median outbreak attack rates by pathogen and setting. Keep in mind that the number of residents or, or patients at risk in the outbreak area is reported to the public health unit as part of outbreak reporting to derive the attack rate. This may include all uh, residents or patients in, a, in, a, in the entire facility or on a particular floor, wing, or unit, depending on how the outbreak area is defined. Median attack rates are generally higher in hospitals compared to long-term care and retirement homes. You see in the green versus the blue. Um, in a hospital, an outbreak may be declared on a particular unit or wing resulting in a lo lower denominator and therefore a higher attack rate. The highest attack rates in hospital outbreaks were due to co seasonal coronaviruses, um, that was 22.5%, and, um, and parainfluenza virus, 22%. Uh, While the highest attack rates in long-term care retirement homes were due to HMPV, um, at 8%, 18% and parainfluenza and RSV both at uh, 17%. Influenza had the lowest attack rates 
in both settings, which is likely related to the fact that this is really the only pathogen where we have measures like vaccine and post-exposure prophylaxis to prevent transmission. This graph shows the median outbreak duration by pathogen and setting over the 10 year surveillance period. Note that the duration is defined from the episode date of the first case in the outbreak and the episode date uh, of the last case of the outbreak. Outbreak duration was generally longer in long term care and retirement homes. Um, compared to hospitals. Um, hospitals are generally more easily able to isolate a cohort individuals with respiratory illness, limiting further transmission within a facility. Also discharging patients can reduce the likelihood of spread within a, a facility within the hospital. Um, outbreaks due to multiple pathogens had the longest duration, which may be due to concurrently circulating pathogens or to overlapping outbreaks caused by different pathogens, increasing both the potential for illness among patients or residents and the complexity of uh, outbreak management. Influenza outbreaks had the shortest duration uh, for both settings, which illustrates the effectiveness of antivirals for both treatment and prophylaxis to quickly bring influenza outbreaks under control, shortening outbreak duration. The difference in median um, outbreak duration between long-term care, uh, retirement homes, and hospital settings was only significantly different for outbreaks due to influenza. So that was eight days compared to five days in hospitals. Most outbreaks result, resulted in no deaths among cases and overall uh, pathogen specific case fatality rates in either setting were relatively low. Um, so this graph shows the case fatality rates by pathogen and healthcare setting. Um, influenza had the highest case fatality rate in long-term care and retirement homes, while HMPV had the highest case fatality rate in hospitals. The lowest case fatality rates were observed in enterorhinovirus and seasonal coronavirus outbreaks in hospitals and uh, long-term care home, uh, retirement home settings, respectively. There was a significant difference in overall influenza case uh, fatality rates between hospitals and long-term care home retirement homes. So that's 2.35% case fatality in hospitals versus 3.5% uh, in uh, long-term care retirement homes. And also there was a significant difference in terms of the unknown number of unknown path pathogen outbreaks. Now this bubble plot summarizes data on the number of uh, outbreaks, case fatality rate and attack rate. Um, despite a small number of outbreaks due to HMPV, these had um, a high case fatality uh, rate and attack rate in hospital settings. Um, and then comparatively to influenza where um, their case fatality and attack rates were relatively quite low, despite the large number of outbreaks. Here is a similar bubble plot summarizing long-term care and retirement home outbreaks by number, attack rate, and case fatality. Similarly, in long-term care, where outbreak, um, while outbreaks due to HMPV had the highest number of um, uh, had the, sorry, the smallest number of outbreaks, these had the highest attack rate um, and the second highest uh, case fatality rate. Unlike in hospitals where, the, in, where influenza had the lowest case fatality rate here in long-term care homes, retirement homes, these outbreaks had the highest case fatality rate. I'll now turn it over to Catherine. Thanks, Camille. So as with any study, ours was not without some limitations. Um, observed differences in the number of outbreaks that were reported to occur within each facility type over the study period may have been influenced by differences in outbreak reporting or facility size. As Camille outlined earlier in the presentation, changes in specimen testing have occurred over time, contributing to improved detection of outbreaks due to pathogens other than influenza and a general associated decline over time in the number of outbreaks due to unknown pathogens. Because of the nature of facility design, hospital outbreaks may be more easily restricted to smaller areas, such as a ward, unit, or floor, for example, whereas an outbreak in a long-term care or retirement home may be more likely to occur across the facility, increasing the number of residents or staff at risk of illness and reducing overall attack rates by increasing the denominator. This may have contributed to the higher attack rates that we observed in hospitals compared to long-term care and retirement home settings in this study. In addition, differences in the proportion of outbreaks due to unknown pathogens may be attributed to different testing algorithms used in hospitals and long-term care and retirement homes. 
As Camille mentioned, long-term care and retirement homes primarily rely on the Public Health Ontario lab for testing, while many hospitals conduct their own testing and may have different testing criteria. Ideally, we would have analyzed data from the long-term care homes and retirement homes separately. However, as Camille has mentioned, due to inconsistent outbreak and facility naming conventions in IFAS, we weren't always able to differentiate between these, particularly when these are co-located in the same facility, uh, resulting in these having to be combined for analyses. Next slide, please. So to summarize some of the key findings from our analyses, although influenza accounted for just over half of all confirmed outbreaks in hospitals and almost a third of those in long-term care and retirement, these had some of the shortest duration and lowest attack rates, which were likely influenced by the availability and use of annual influenza vaccine and the early introduction of antivirals. Despite just under 4% of all outbreaks in our data set being due to HMPV, this pathogen was associated with some of the highest case fatality rates in both settings. And similarly, HMPV outbreaks were associated with the highest resident attack rate in long-term care and retirement homes. To go back to my earlier slide regarding the importance of testing for pathogen identification and outbreak management, while the symptoms and seasonality of HMPV are similar to other respiratory pathogens, compared to most of these, including influenza, HMPV has a longer incubation period and a longer communicable period. So it would be important to identify this pathogen in particular and to tailor outbreak measures accordingly to bring outbreak transmission under control and to ensure that we're leaving those control measures in place for an appropriate length of time. Given the comparatively high attack rates and case fatality rates associated with HMPV, it stands to reason that the introduction of stricter control measures for outbreaks in which this pathogen is identified could potentially result in reduced attack rates and fewer deaths among cases. Next slide, please. So further thinking about the applicability of our study findings to current outbreak management guidance, as the ability to identify and differentiate between pathogens has increased over time, and as there are pathogen-specific differences in associated morbidity and mortality, as we've shown here in this study, this means that outbreak management practices can also be tailored by pathogen and setting. So one of our biggest takeaways from our study findings was that although outbreaks due to HMPV and parainfluenza virus accounted for a small proportion of all outbreaks due to known pathogens in either setting, their comparatively high attack rates and the high overall case fatality rate for HMPV in particular may warrant specific outbreak management guidelines that are more restrictive, such as stricter isolation um, potentially and restricting movement within and between facilities. Conversely, while enterovirus and rhinovirus were a common cause of outbreaks in both settings, these outbreaks were associated with generally lower attack rates, case fatality rates, and outbreak duration. So specific outbreak management guidance for these pathogens could therefore be potentially more permissive. Next slide, please. So as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, current outbreak management guidance in Ontario does advise that most outbreaks can generally be declared over eight days after the onset of symptoms in the last identified patient or resident case. While the guidance does encourage public health units to determine an appropriate outbreak duration based on the identified pathogen and on the epidemiology of the individual outbreak, the bulk of outbreak management guidance is either specific to influenza or more general to all pathogens spread by droplet and contact transmission. So this means that there's no explicit pathogen specific outbreak management guidance for non-influenza outbreaks. Development of pathogen-specific outbreak management guidance that takes into account the incubation and communicable periods of specific pathogens, in addition to their associated morbidity and mortality in healthcare settings, could contribute to positive outcomes for both residents or patients and staff. Although confirmatory lab testing is not required for an outbreak to be declared, given the increased ability to test for and to identify individual causative pathogens, testing of symptomatic individuals should be prioritized to inform outbreak management practices. Next slide, please. So I'll now hand it back to Camille to review the impact of COVID-19 on viral respiratory outbreak trends. So here is a look at uh, more recent trends and pathogens associated with uh, respiratory outbreaks, in excluding SARS-CoV-2 over the past year or so. As you can see in this um, chart, um, the most commonly identified pathogen was an enterorhinovirus. And as can be seen here, little of anything else. This uh, graph shows the percent positivity for viral respiratory uh, pathogen testing results at PHOL over the past year. These would include all respiratory specimens, not just uh, respiratory outbreak specimens, as you can see with exception of, um, of enterorhinovirus in the blue here. Um, very few um, pathogens were circulating widely within the community or healthcare setting over the past year. 
And then looking specifically at COVID-19 outbreaks, um, this is a donor chart uh, summarizing the proportion of outbreaks by healthcare, um, sorry, COVID-19 outbreaks by healthcare setting. And um, depending on the setting and definition of outbreak, um, sorry, and the, def the definition of, out of an outbreak may vary depending on the setting. And up until April 23rd, COVID-19 outbreak definitions differed for hospitals compared to long-term care and retirement homes. However, the numbers represented here um, represent the total uh, number of confirmed COVID-19 outbreaks. And you can see that the highest proportion of COVID-19 outbreaks were declared in long-term care homes, which accounted for 50 50.7% of all outbreaks in healthcare settings. Combined outbreaks in long-term care and retirement homes account for 80% of COVID-19 outbreaks in healthcare settings. And I'll turn it over to Catherine to finish off. Thanks, Camille. So as Camille mentioned, one of the most interesting observations over the last year or so during the COVID-19 pandemic was the marked decline in the number of outbreaks due to other viral respiratory pathogens, such as influenza. So while there were changes to laboratory testing practices to assist in COVID-19 case detection, as SARS-CoV-2 and the other pathogens that we've discussed uh, during this presentation today are all primarily spread via droplet and contact transmission, the implementation of control measures for COVID-19 likely also prevented the transmission of other viral respiratory pathogens that we would normally see and that are less transmissible than COVID-19. So measures such as masking for source control, physical distancing, and an emphasis on ongoing symptom screening, contact tracing, and isolation, for example, likely reduce the potential for an individual infected with a viral respiratory pathogen to transmit illness to others in the community. Next slide, please. Many of the measures that were instituted in healthcare settings during the COVID-19 pandemic are those that are typically implemented during a viral respiratory outbreak in these settings. Isolation of ill residents and patients, the use of droplet and contact precautions by staff providing care to ill residents or patients, the use of cleaning and disinfection products with efficacy against the identified pathogen, an emphasis on hand hygiene, implementation of visitor restrictions, and reminders to follow good cough and sneeze etiquette are all measures normally implemented during respiratory outbreaks. While these can be very effective in limiting and controlling disease transmission when they're rapidly implemented and consistently followed in a facility during an outbreak, some measures are only brought into effect when one or more cases has been identified in a facility. Next slide, please. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been continued messaging regarding the importance of hand hygiene and environmental cleaning, and a specific focus on the importance of enhancing ventilation indoors and of isolating any individuals suspected or confirmed to be ill with or exposed to COVID-19. Other measures that have been widely instituted and encouraged during the pandemic, both in healthcare settings and in the broader community, are physical distancing, the use of non-medical masks for source control, and particularly when physical distancing cannot be maintained, and an increased emphasis on self-monitoring for symptoms of illness as a prompt to pursue confirmatory testing and to self-isolate. Healthcare facilities have also implemented outbreak control measures beyond those that are normally routinely implemented during respiratory outbreaks. These include an increased use of cohorting among ill residents confirmed to be infected with the same pathogen, the establishment of designated isolation sites and step-down facilities, dedication of staff to a single unit or facility, enhanced on-site screening and testing of residents and staff, increased frequency of disinfection, particularly of those high-touch surfaces, and a reduced use of wardrooms in long-term care homes. Next slide, please. So putting all of this together, um, combining our study findings with the observed pathogen detection trends during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, several considerations for future outbreak management can be proposed. It is likely that the additional infection prevention and control measures instituted in healthcare settings and in the broader community during the COVID-19 pandemic have contributed to the observed decline in other viral respiratory pathogens. And given their effectiveness, it would be prudent to at least consider maintaining some of these on an ongoing basis or during usual calendar periods of increased viral respiratory illness, for example. Early pathogen detection in healthcare settings is key to inform outbreak control measures and to limit transmission of illness within facilities. So confirmatory testing should be encouraged as early as possible in an outbreak, and this information used to inform subsequent outbreak control measures. Outbreak control measures could be more permissive for those pathogens associated with lower attack and case fatality rates, and could be more restrictive for those known to be associated with higher case fatality rates. For those outbreaks where more than one pathogen is identified or where the causative pathogen is unknown, consideration could be given to managing the outbreak as per the most restrictive guidance. Next slide, please. 
And that brings us to the end of our formal presentation. We'd like to acknowledge and thank the organizations, groups, and individuals listed here for their respective contributions. Next slide, please. And for those interested in reading our full study, the citation and link to the published research are here. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll turn it back over to Michelle. Thank you so much, Camille and Catherine. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, I'm going to invite all of our, our guests to please use the Q&A pod uh, to put in your questions for Camille and Catherine. And we do have a few questions already in there. So maybe I'll start uh, with the ones that are in there. Uh, so either for Camille or Catherine, if there's a question about clarifying the definition of what is acute respiratory infection, uh, as noted that in the Appendix B, um, it's defined as any new onset um, presents with newer worsening cough or shortness of breath and often fever, um, and asking about whether other symptoms could be included in this definition. Sorry, was that for me, Michelle? Uh, I, I guess either Catherine or Camille, if you had want to comment on application of that definition of the ARI. I know that there's also surveillance definitions through IPAC Canada that include um, other respiratory symptoms. So for example, a newer worsening cough, um, nasal congestion, things like that. So if someone doesn't have um, just a fever, for example, it wouldn't exclude ARI. Um, I think any combination of upper respiratory symptoms could be considered uh, ARI. Yeah, I mean, I think my only comment, um, I agree with that there have been other definitions. I mean, the Appendix D definition is um, a surveillance definition that's used in Ontario. Um, so, so for the large part, a lot of our outbreaks end up being laboratory confirmed as Camille and Catherine have shown in terms of having an actual pathogen. And as soon as you have a pathogen, um, then the syndromic surveillance definition of what constitutes an outbreak becomes less important once you have that kind of causative organism showing that you have um, an outbreak of, of two or more cases. Um, but that if you, if you never have uh, an outbreak or another or an organism identified, um, that you are really relying on that clinical syndrome to ensure that you are meeting definition for, for calling that uh, an outbreak, among, a respiratory outbreak in an institution or public hospital. Uh, so another one for either Camille or Catherine, um, are outbreaks also tracked or recorded by Kai Hai? I don't know if either of you are aware of that. I'm, I'm not aware of Kai Hai uh, tracking outbreaks. As far as I know, um, they're reported in IFIS, and so PHO has access to the surveillance data, and so we, we typically would report on that data. Okay. Uh, another question is, if, did you see any trends in the number of influenza outbreaks in years where there was vaccine mismatch with the circulating strains? So I want to punt this to you, Michelle, because I know you have looked at it. Um, we didn't look at it specifically for this particular paper, but I know PHO and you have led um, a paper looking at uh, this. Yeah, I think you know, in your paper um, was looking at was, was more about overall trends in um, it, of all types of respiratory, so not just specific to flu. Um, we have looked uh, in the past to trying to look at trends in outbreaks and cases in years where there has or has not been a vaccine mismatch. And, and to be honest, it's, it's been um, challenging to look at it uh, very explicitly because sort of there's a number of factors that can lead into um, whether or not there, you know, the, the total number of, of outbreaks associated with uh, infections. We did see, you know, some decent cross protection with uh, influenza B. We have a, another paper um, uh, from PHO that looked at uh, influenza B outbreaks explicitly in, in uh, long term care and retirement homes as well as hospital settings. Um, and, and you know, generally influenza B is, is less uh, severe, can be less severe in an elderly population. So uh, we have still seen some um, cross protection, but uh, certainly I think that there, when we when we know that there have been years of, of vaccine mismatch, um, typically some of the main changes that we would see in terms of, of how they're being managed is whether or not we would consider antivirals for individuals who have been vaccinated. So where all residents um, in an outbreak would be offered antivirals as part of prophylaxis, uh, typically staff who are vaccinated are not provided um, antivirals, but that can be a consideration in years um, when we do have an anti uh, a vaccine mismatch. There's another question here um, from Elizabeth Ray on uh, one routine respiratory outbreak measure not listed is strict staff cohorting to the affected unit or floor. This was critical and very effective intervention for limiting the spread of COVID outbreaks, though an expensive one for long-term care and retirement homes, since it means having to overstaff. 
implications for non-COVID outbreak recommendations? Maybe you can turn that to Catherine. Sure, sorry, I just had to unmute. So I think ideally it, in a perfect world, we would dedicate staff and not have a lot of crossover either within a facility or between facilities. But as you mentioned, sorry, I can't see the question anymore. Um, as you mentioned, obviously that's not necessarily feasible for staffing. I think why that was more um, of a concern or has been more of a concern during COVID is because of the r not for COVID and it being more transmissible than the pathogens that we normally deal with during fall and winter. So I think, um, that's why testing again is so important and knowing what the actual pathogen is that you're dealing with. And then it's going into what we were saying about being able to be potentially more permissive or restrictive, knowing what you're dealing with. So if it's something that has a lower or not like influenza, we'd be less concerned um, potentially about staff being a, a primary source of transmission potentially. But I think with, uh, again, just going back to the importance of pathogen identification, I don't know if you wanna add anything there, uh, Michelle or Camille. I think, I think good question. And I think, well, we're definitely heading into a season where we might actually see what that's going to play out as, you know, obviously last year where we had almost no um, non-COVID respiratory viruses circulating in Ontario. We, we don't really have an experience of what it's like to have a mixed picture of, uh, of COVID plus other, other um, viruses. But I think certainly will be uh, more to, to see in this coming year in terms of how that's going to play out in terms of um, uh, homes and, and how we can help protect uh, not just against COVID, but other, other respiratory viruses. Another question here um, from Keith McGlone around how source of ongoing contamination from services, bathrooms, and sinks been identified. So I'm not sure if that's related specifically to, to COVID or to other um, respiratory infections, but uh, maybe we'll sort of interpret it as early viruses. Uh, maybe again, turn that one to Catherine from your IPAC hat. Sure, sorry, I missed you cut out for a second there, Michelle. Were you saying to, uh, to answer generally or COVID specific? I guess, I, I guess either if you want to interpret uh, generally or COVID specifically around ongoing contamination from services. I'm not sure if there has been um, anything looking at this recently, but generally for most pathogens spread by a droplet in contact, we know that the particles are quite large and they settle out within about one to two meters. So if um, you're doing, I don't know if you're doing monitoring in your own facility and identifying that there's ongoing contamination, I'd suggest doing an environmental cleaning audit and looking at your actual practices. I know from my own experiences going into facilities, often we find deficiencies when you have that extra set of eyes. There is breakdowns happening within the procedures themselves where something's being missed. So either a cloth is being used like room to room, for example, or a toilet brush, something like that, when it should be dedicated. Um, so basically taking a closer look at your practices and then looking if you're actually following best practice going from um, clean to dirty kind of thing. Thanks, Kevin. There's a... There, there's a follow-up question uh, from another participant around a similar um, concept of, do we know how many infections have been linked to high-touch surfaces through okay. droplet? Uh, either, if you have an answer. Sure, I think that's hard to quantify just because the primary, so for COVID, for example, the primary mode of transmission is through droplet and being within that close one to two meter range of someone that is infectious and coughing or sneezing, for example. Um, so I know fomite transmission, we were initially at the beginning um, unsure, but as more evidence has come out, I think it's a less common form of potential transmission. So um, the focus has been on masking for source control and then maintaining that physical distancing and ideally layering these measures in combination. Um, so I don't think fomite transmission is a very um, large contributor, but it's often difficult to identify a single cause, like to identify where someone actually got something. But I'd say the focus should be more on like the actual droplet and being within close proximity. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, Another question uh, that's, I guess, again, maybe similar vein to, to kind of roots of transmission concepts for respiratory viruses. If there's any reports of transmissions of COVID or influenza while taking public transit during rush hour in crowded go trains or buses or subways, and is there a timeline of exposure level based on length of travel time? I, I'm happy to start, and if Catherine, you know, if you want to jump in, kind of another work that you've done. Uh, I mean, I, I do recall there was a paper I think looked at the London subway that looked at for influenza transmission. I think this came about a year or two ago, 
um, in terms of travel times on the tube in London and uh, and the risk of people's uh, influenza outbreak. So so again, like couldn't necessarily um, directly link to whether or not that's where the person got influenza, but uh, to assess their overall risk of, of, of influenza by their duration of time taking the subway there and, and did found an association. Uh, you know, I think there's uh, lots of confluence, you know, in terms of going back to what Catherine's mentioned about the, the way different respiratory viruses are transmitted. So is it a fact of being in a very closed and confined space, lots of other people, um, you know, lots of touching of different surfaces as you're moving through that kind of uh, station, you know, being in an environment where there's probably less ventilation uh, or air circulation to, you know, if you're an underground type of subway environment or in a bus environment. So I, I think that there is, you know, a lot to unpack that, that's very difficult to say, you know, what, what is it exactly about that being in that situation that is driving the transmission? And probably there is no answer. There's probably, a, you know, that confluence of, of factors that is really, you know, relating to why um, transmission might be happening in that kind of public environment. I don't know, Catherine, Camille, if you wanted to speak about other work you're aware of or been part of. I think you answered that nicely. Okay. We still have a few more questions. There's no more uh, current questions in the chat pod. Um, we'll see if maybe in, if anyone else uh, wants to maybe Maybe I can sort of take moderator prerogative and ask a, a question um, about uh, kind of your, your guys' predictions, sort of seeing, you know, we had, we didn't have much uh, non-COVID last year, but, but coming into this current year, uh, what are your sort of thoughts for surveillance about how, how we could be looking for um, other respiratory viruses that might be causing outbreaks in, in these settings going forward in the 2021-22 season? Well, I think the lab testing changes as announced two weeks ago are going to be very helpful in terms of, uh, I guess, monitoring and surveillance. And um, so I think it's quite timely in terms of um, trying to get a sense of um, how things are going to change, obviously, with more mixing and more more interaction between people. And when schools open, there'll be um, a higher likelihood of transmission of viruses um, between people. And so it'll be good. It will be really important, I guess, to continue new monitoring the data and, and looking at trends. Thanks, Camille. Well, we have uh, one question in, uh, in the Q&A around um, if, if either of you foresee a growth in the use of AI or fuzzy logic systems to handle, analyze the multi-factors associated with infections or viral outbreaks. That's a good question. I personally would like to see some social network analysis. I think it would be an interesting way to look, especially as you mentioned, Michelle, there's a confluence of different things. And people tend to, if they're commuting to work, for example, they might stop for coffee and like spend time in a, an office building, or whatever. I think it would be really, really interesting to do some social network analysis and try and tease out some of those nodes or different things where we might be seeing um, more risk of illness, for example. So. I think that's evolving and we're learning as we go. And uh, over time, we'll start seeing more publications out there that have explored different ways of looking at the data and trying to identify where these transmissions are actually occurring. Thank you. Camille, did you have thoughts on, on you know, better ways of how we can do this type of analysis, if there's AI or otherwise? Um, I'm not personally familiar, but I'm sure um, the field is evolving and um, I'm looking forward to seeing how things start to be applied in surveillance. Yeah, I think it's, it's a great caution. I mean, you know, certainly um, big data and, you know, things like whole genome sequencing are definitely uh, dramatically changing our, our way of understanding transmission and, and how we're disentangling outbreaks and, and where transmission is occurring. So I think some, some really exciting times ahead in terms of, of improving our understanding of, of how these types of viruses are being transmitted. Well, I, I'm not seeing any other questions and we're coming up close to the time. So maybe I'll just take this opportunity to, uh, to wrap up today's Public Health Ontario round session. I'd like to thank Camille and Catherine for your excellent presentation today. I'd also like to thank everyone who's joined us for today's session. It's great to see such strong virtual participation during such a challenging time for healthcare professionals, as well as during a, a summer time as well, when people might be on vacation. 
You can all expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO round survey for today's session. If you could please try to complete this to help us improve our programming. And lastly, uh, if you'd like access to any past PHO rounds presentations and to view confirmed upcoming present sessions, please visit the PHO website. If you can head to the education and events tab, uh, you can click on any presentations that are available. Thank you so much for joining today and hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.